I like that image in um, The Pilgrim's Progress. Has anyone read The Pilgrim's Progress? Okay. Two of us have, so forget what I was going to say. <laughs> Heavenly Father. <laughs> no, there's a scene in The Pilgrim's Progress where uh, the main character, whose name is Christian, has been walking around with a gigantic burden on his back. And the more he becomes aware of Christ and of the things of God and of the kingdom of God, the heavier this burden feels uh, to him. And so he's, he's on his way towards the city of God, fleeing the city of destruction. And in one scene in the book, he comes around the bend and he finds uh, a cross and he stands in front of the cross and as he stands in front of the cross and gazes upon the cross, the burden that was on his back fell off and rolled into an open tomb. And I think that's just, that's just the way it is. That's how God set it up. That when we have a clear image of his son Jesus on the cross bearing our sins, all of a sudden we realize, I don't have to bear them anymore. And the burden falls off at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks because of your son Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us, who as the Bible says, became sin. He became sin so that we through him might become the people of God. And that's what we are this morning because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So as your children, Lord, we ask that you would now speak to us through me, your servant, speak your words of life and healing, speak your words of reconciliation and joy, speak your calling into us in order, Lord, that we may bear the family resemblance even more. For Jesus' sake, amen. One of the things that I have heard over and over and over again as a pastor, um, specifically in the United Methodist Church, but just in general, as I meet with pastors in different denominations and in different settings, is a general fear, a general concern about uh, the impending death and doom of the church. It particularly happens every time I go to a conference and you look around at who's there at the conference. And when you realize that uh, you are the youngest pastor in the room or that the youngest attendant is three years older than you, people begin to lament the impending death of the church because of our inability to reach young people. It haunts almost every single Christian conference that I attend. It's even been something that's been raised here at Friendship. People look around and wonder, where are all the young people? Because clearly there's young people in Wyoming. I mean, families specifically <laughs> moved to Wyoming for the schools, so we know that there are young people here. But it's a concern that's on most every pastor's mind, most every parishioner's mind, because we have a faith that was meant to be passed along, right? We have a faith that's meant to be passed along. So what happened that it's not being passed along in such a way that gives us confidence or hope? Well, we're gonna talk about that a little bit, um, and that's based off of the book that we're studying, uh, You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. But before we get there, I wanted to recap a little bit from, from last week where we discuss the importance of family. And one of the things we discussed is how, according to scripture, the family that's most important is God's family, capital F. And from God's family emerges nuclear families with a lowercase f. And I know that this is a jarring concept because the world we live in suggests that lowercase family is most important that you put family before all things. So it does come to you as kind of strange uh, to hear a word that suggests that the most important family actually isn't the family that shares the same 
DNA with you, but it's the family of God that shares the same DNA in a different sense because we've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's a jarring concept, but I think it's helpful to remember, and this is why I wanted to recap, it's helpful to remember that Jesus' redemption project wasn't just a redemption project to rescue sinners from the grips of death and sin and hell. But his, redemp his redemption process was more like a, uh, an adoption than it was the Navy SEALs going to get somebody that they don't know. It was more like an adoption. As it says in John 1, 11 through 12, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed on his name, he gave them the right to be called the children of God. So when Jesus redeemed us, when we say, I have been saved, what we're saying is that I have been adopted into the family of God. I've been brought into a new family. Adoption is a big deal. Adoption's a real big deal. My mom was adopted. Adoption's a big deal. Some of you have experienced adoption either as a child or as a family bringing children into your home. Adoption's a really big deal because through adoption, someone is getting a new name with new rights and new privileges, right? If, if a child is adopted into your home, they no longer have to like, come to your door and say, can I come in, right? Why? Because now they live there. They don't have to ask you, can I get some milk out of the refrigerator? Now, if, if your child's friend comes to your home, they may have to do that. Why? Because they're just friends. They don't live there. You know, they, they can't, don't just be walking up in my house. But when you're adopted, it changes everything. So we have to see Jesus' redemption process in, in new eyes. Not Navy SEALs, not anything like that, rescuing people and just, just kind of transferring them from here to here. But we have to see it as, hey, I want you to come and be part of my family. Come and be, come become a part of my family. Come and be a part of God's household. So he saves us by bringing us into his family. We are right now sisters and brothers of Jesus Christ. We're his little sisters and his little brothers, which also um, answers the question to why there's not going to be any marriage in heaven. Who are you going to marry, you know? We're all sisters and brothers, so it's going to change everything. Our identity will be that of relatives of the closest order with the tightest connections. So whenever we gather together with a large gathering, such as we are today, we're gathered together as family, with a capital F, the family of God. And what we do when we gather together is engage in certain traditions, traditions and rituals that help us bear the family resemblance even more. So for example, we just did a confession together. In the family, we did that because in the family of God, truth is valued over the lie. And so in order to bear the family likeness even more, when we gather together, we make sure that we confess. We have not loved you with all of our hearts. We have failed to announce the reign of God. We have failed to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We do that not just because God said so, but because we're part of the family now. We're part of the family. We give. Why? Because God said you should give. No, because in God's family, generosity is the norm. And so because we want to become like our big brother who rescued us, who, who according to his mercy and his pleading, welcomed us into his, his father's household, we give because we're practicing to be like him, to be generous ourselves. And so we engage in these traditions that form us and that frame us so that as we leave this place, we leave resembling our big brother a little bit more. These rituals and liturgies uh, that emerge from God's large family, capital F, recalibrate our hearts toward God. So as we come in here this morning, we come in as people um, who have had our hearts throughout the week twisted a little bit, 
as the world was saying, no, come and receive all those things from us. Our hearts were slightly turned and we come in here and God's like, no, let me just recalibrate that a little bit so you can learn to live towards me. And as we, as we do that, as we engage in these liturgies and in these rituals, we're invited to take these liturgical practices that we learned from the family of God and bring them into our nuclear families. And as I said last week, uh, some of them may be religious. You know, I hope that every Christian family in some way is a family of prayer, whether it's praying together as a family or whether it's the parents praying for the children. But I hope prayer is in the presence of every single Christian uh, household. So not all of them have to be religious. I hope that in some way discussions of God are there. They don't have to be at a high theological level, but I'm sh I hope that sometimes uh, kids are asking questions about God and parents are talking to their children about God. So there are the religious liturgical practices that we bring into our home, but not all of them have to be, have to have the aroma of religion on them. And I actually think it's good that most of them don't have the, the aroma of religion on them. Why? Because the place we live our lives isn't religion, right? We live our lives at school and we live our lives at work and we live our lives doing recreation. And so we have to learn to bear the family resemblance in all of those ways. Therefore, engaging in liturgical practices that don't appear religious, but still help us become like our big brother are gonna be the sort of things that all of us should have uh, in the midst of our family. We should, we should adopt certain habits and family traditions that create a hum within our family um, that reinforce the idea that we are, in fact, people of God. So, for example, uh, the confession. It's good for, all, for every single parent to allow their kids to tell the truth. We talked about this in class a few weeks ago. Some psychologists were, were wondering why it is that many people um, embrace the lie even though the truth is evident. They were talking mostly about politicians. And some psychologists suggested, well, there's been a trend within households where parents do not allow their kids to tell the truth. You know, they'll, they'll just go out and accuse their kids. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And so what happens is when kids aren't afforded the opportunity to confess, they never learn how to do so. They never learn the benefits of it. Fast forward and now they're adults and they've committed some sort of horrible thing. They're a politician, they're standing in front of everybody. And now, instead of understanding the thing that's gonna save me the most in this situation is to tell the truth, but because they've never practiced telling the truth, even from a small child, they embrace the lie. So in our households, we give our kids the opportunity to confess, not by standing in front of us and saying, um, mother and father, I have failed to love you with all my heart. I have failed to do this, I have failed to do that. But just to stand there and say, I'm sorry, I, I did that. That doesn't appear to be specifically religious, but it's particularly formative in a very deep and meaningful way that will enable you to raise people of the truth. Singing, and this is where I was going last week, I, I, I failed to make the connection, but singing, throughout the Bible it says that uh, our homes and our gatherings should be filled with uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But the fact of the matter is, singing has such a powerful impact on our lives that the songs we sing can be tools that will shape our families going forward. How often have you guys heard a song being played and immediately your mind was just transported to some other memory, you know? It happens all the time. You hear a tune and immediately you're like captivated. You're back to that place, your senior high prom or the time you're on vacation or your wedding, all because music transports you there. And, and Charles Wesley was brilliant at this. Because he knew the power of song, he would take the popular songs of his day and co-opt them for Jesus Christ. So people couldn't hear the tune anymore without thinking about the gospel. 
That's why I mentioned that, that song that I, I, I'm not even gonna try to, uh, to say who the character is that sings it, but the Disney song, right? Because I, I, we do those things all the time. We just sing songs. In, in fact, I'll sing that song, uh, Ooby Doo, I wanna be like you. And on the way to school one day, my daughter Charlie was like, are you gonna use that song in a sermon or something like that? <laughs> what happened? She made the connection somehow that song, he's, talking, he's not talking about the little, the man cub. He's singing that song about Jesus. At my last church, I preached a sermon where I, I used the popular song of the day. And to this day, six years later, I still get a few emails during, uh, during the year that I say, you won't believe what song I just heard. I heard that song and it reminded me of that sermon you preached on the, uh, the parable of the sower. Songs are important. Fill your homes with songs that point to Jesus. Now, they don't have to be songs that say Jesus, 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 Jesus. But it'll have a powerful impact, so much so that as you're driving around, to this day as I'm driving around, I'll, I'll hear songs that my mom or my dad sang all the time. And it will remind me. And in that way, you're bypassing the intellectual models of teaching going straight to the heart straight to the heart. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The benefits of having liturgies like this or practices like this or setting the tone of your home is that it shapes us within the family of God and within our families in a way that teaches us the gospel uh, kinesthetically. Or it teaches us the gospel by feel or by experience. Wouldn't you like to know God by feel. I would much, much rather prefer to know God by feel than by intellect, right? In the same way, if you've ever tried to teach a child to ride a bike, you find it incredibly difficult, right? Because you know how to ride a bike more by feel than by intellect. So when you tell them, oh, all you got to do is balance, all you got to do is it's like, that's not all you have to do. There's more you have to do. But since you know it this way more, you can't explain it to them that way. Or, or another example is, I, I remember the first time I called my mom when I was in college and asked her how to make a dish that she always made for us, jollof rice. And if you have never had jollof rice, then your life up to this point hasn't been blessed by God. And I encourage you to immediately find a trustworthy Nigerian and my, and my mom will charge you. So probably find someone else and ask them to make some jollof rice because it's fantastic. So I, as a college student, I call my mom. I have a, a hunger for jollof rice. How do you make this? Here's what she starts saying. Well, you want to get some rice, and you're going to throw in a pinch of this and a dash of that. And, you, and I'm like, what is a pinch or a dash? I need IKEA instructions, you know? Tell me exactly, but why is she talking like that? because she cooks by feel, right? She knows how to make this stuff, not merely by instruction, but she's been doing it for such a long time that she just does it by feel. She feels her way through bringing forth a good meal. The question of this week's chapter is, what if we knew the gospel that way, by feel rather than by mere head knowledge? What if we felt our way through life in the kingdom of God? What if, what if learning to have the mind of Christ was less like memorizing a map and more like learning how to live and move and have our being in the Lord Jesus Christ? And how can we form and educate young people so that they know the gospel in their bones rather than just in their brains? The author of this book unsurprisingly advocates for immersing our children in some of the ancient practices and liturgies of the church. And in many ways, I think he's spot on. He advocates for an approach to getting the gospel into kids in a way that they'll never forget. And that's through, he, he recommends more of a tactile approach, you know, with their bodies, with their fingers. Uh, Cindy did this a few weeks ago where she was she set up one of these uh, hopscotch stations. 
and the kids would jump from one block to another, but each block was a scripture. And by jumping from here to there, the kids didn't know it, but they were memorizing the verse. And in our staff meeting later that week, Cindy said, now if I would have stood there with uh, cards and just gave these kids a card and they memorized it by rote, maybe one or two of the kids would have left that day knowing that passage of scripture. But as the kids are engaging that with their bodies, somehow that scripture gets into their brain through their feet, right? And, and I guarantee you going forward, if they ever play hopscotch again anywhere else, they're gonna remember scripture. Jesus did this all the time when he's preaching. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but Solomon in all his beauty isn't more beautiful than these little flowers. Now, what do you think those people would do as they're walking around seeing beautiful flowers? Consider the lilies of the field. Jesus was a, he was a genius. Well, think about what he did with communion. He co-ops every single meal that they have. Whenever you sit down and eat or drink, I want you to do it in my name. This is my body broken for you. So he's teaching in tactile ways, and that's what the author of this book recommends, that we teach in tactile ways. He, he would recommend a kind of tradition where the, the, the church is filled with, um, with icons on the wall that tell stories of the saints. The church is filled with things that you smell and things that you can touch so that in ways that go beyond your mind, you're being, your heart is being formed before your brain is being informed. And there's a lot of truth and a lot of power to this. I love churches that are filled with, uh, with icons, for example. I love the liturgical traditions for the reason that, that he is um, pointing to. In fact, I remember the, the year we, we did our uh, sabbatical, starting off at Gethsemane in Kentucky and joining the monks in the, the practice of the divine hours waking up several times a day to go for 30 minutes to pray. And we would kneel together, and we would stand up together, and we would do the sign of the cross together. All those things I loved because I didn't have to come and think about anything. I just had to participate. And I noticed some of the things that they did, like as they passed uh, the Lord's table, if the candle was lit, they would bow. Now, what are you bowing for? Oh, because the candle represents the presence of Christ. And so we teach ourselves to, to, to revere Christ through the things that we do. I love that sort of thing. I, when we were in uh, Rome, my wife and I visited so many old churches that were very small. But if you look around the wall, you just saw this saint and that saint. You saw this story of the Bible depicted in art on the walls. And in some way, even, even if we went in there and nobody else was there, I left feeling as if I heard the word of God preached to me because I saw it represented all over the place. That's why they started doing iconography. And that's why old churches are filled with images because they're trying to teach people. And they realized these people aren't just going to merely learn by some pastor standing up to preach the word of God. Therefore, let's invite them into a space where it feels like worship is happening all the time, where the incense burning will remind them of the burning that, goes, that takes place in the altar. So he, 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 his recommendation is that if we're going to teach children well, we would invite them into that kind of atmosphere so that if the preaching is boring that morning, which if you ask younger people, it always is, at least the stories that are on the wall, they'll be immersed into that. And I agree with him. I think that is a wonderful way, not only for children to be invited into the story of God, but for everybody to be invited into the story of God. But then I believe he took a bit of an unfortunate turn. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to mention this 
because I feel like he made an unfortunate turn that places too much trust in the rituals, in the practices, in the liturgies. Because after he highlights the positive of liturgically driven worship, he makes what's in my opinion the unfortunate turn by going on to highlight how, and he does this correctly, and many people don't know this, but uh, the idea of having a children's church separated from adults and youth separated from adults, that was driven by fear, not by faith. That was created because of some of the concerns I mentioned at the top of the sermon. Our children are going to leave. And then they said, oh, they're leaving because uh, uh, worship service is boring. Okay, let's create something separate for them to do where they'll be always engaged. And so they started creating youth ministries and things like that. Look through church history, you'll see that that's the reason why. The reason wasn't because of something faith-based, but it was because of something fear-based. So he, he accurately highlights that as the motivating factor, where, where, whereby now many um, groups are focused on fun and fellowship, and they're not being formed into little disciples of Jesus Christ. All of that's true, but the unfortunate turn for me was when he began wondering what it would be like if those same kids simply started attending church with their parents and participating in the liturgies again. And he makes it seem as if that, if that was the case, that all of a sudden, all of us would become more and more like Jesus. Now, as I said, I'm a huge advocate for, uh, for liturgically driven worship. And I'm also a huge advocate of families worshiping together. That's why we tried having our own uh, Sunday school options separate from our hour of worship so everybody could come. I don't mind when babies cry in worship. I think it's wonderful, you know. I remember the first pastor uh, that I served under when I joined the Methodist Church, when they introduced me, kind of like I introduced Tyler this morning, uh, I think it was my son uh, Eli at the time. He started crying, you know? And I was like, okay, Eli. You know, I introduced my family. Then I said, uh, okay, Eli, now it's time to be quiet so we can continue in worship. And that pastor interrupted me and he said, no, no, no. You let him cry as much as he wants to. He's welcome here too. And that taught me something. That taught me something. All are welcome here. This, this place isn't just for people uh, who know how to sit down and be quiet but it's for all people. And we should frame our worship services so that all people can be engaged in the same way. So he taught me something. And so I'm an advocate for everybody worshiping together. But here's where I disagree with the author. He makes, he places too much emphasis on ritual and not enough, and not enough emphasis on a heart being captivated by Jesus because the basis of engaging in spiritual disciplines or rituals is always on the basis of friendship or relationship to Jesus Christ. If someone just engages in ritual or liturgy because they think that the ritual or liturgy will transform them, that person will end up like the Old Testament people who always engaged in ritual and liturgy. And how often do we read the Bible? In fact, let me read this verse for you. This is from Amos 5, 21 through 24. Listen to what God says to these people. I hate, H-A-T-E. This is, this is God, the creator of heaven and earth speaking. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I won't even look at them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, the melody of your harps. I will not listen to them. But then he goes and he points to what he really wants. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So what's he saying? God's saying to them, I could care less about the fact that you went through the motions. Because your heart is far from me, he says. So the solution, in my opinion, is not merely correct rituals and liturgies. 
that must be in place. But understanding that people can engage in correct liturgy while having a corrupt heart means that the primary focus has to be on captivating the heart. And the primary way of captivating the heart is by having someone whose heart has already been captivated. Invite the person. Isn't that how it happened with Jesus? People didn't come to Jesus and say, teach us how to pray. But they came to Jesus because they were captivated by the kind of life he had. And then after hanging around Jesus, they started doing the things that Jesus was doing. So the way to invite our kids back into the life of the church, in my opinion, and I'd encourage you guys, if you're going to side with someone, side with him more than you side with me because he's much more learned than I am. But in my opinion, just from observing how things have worked through church history, the way saints are made is by hanging out with other saints. Not by merely doing the things those saints do. That's important. But the people who lament the fact that kids are not in church, the finger must first be pointed to ourselves. Because if the kids saw something in the lives of the parents, and if the parishioners saw something in the life of the pastor that was otherworldly in much the same way that the people that it speaks about in Matthew 3 who sat in, in the darkness saw a great, life in, a great light in Jesus, if they saw that and realized that that life was received in this assembly, they would be here because kids and adults of all ages want to be involved in something transformative, but they must first see that it actually is something transformative. I don't know what to tell young people, and I meet them all the time, and they apologize to me about not coming to church, but when they get down to the end of it and they, they tell me why they don't go to church, they say, I really don't get anything out of it. It doesn't do anything for me. And I understand. So the solution, and I have to close here, and oddly enough, he gets back to it in this chapter when he alludes to the fact that uh, when you're on an airplane and you need to put on the mask, you know, they instruct you to put yours on first. The solution for everyone, including myself, who laments the fact that there are no young people in church is for me to become a holy person. The one thing that I owe you all as a pastor is a holy life. The one thing parents, the one thing parents need to offer their kids is their holiness. Because if we offer holiness to God and to one another, people will want to do whatever it takes to stay on the path to holiness. But if we place the majority on the, of the emphasis on the rituals, then we shouldn't be surprised if we hear the Lord saying, I hate, I despise your confessions. I despise your offering. I despise your gatherings. Because your hearts are far from me. We need hearts that are close to him. Hearts that have been transformed by being in the presence of Christ. That being the case, people will do whatever it takes. If Michael Jordan rolled up on some kids playing basketball, and he said to them, listen, I would like to take you into a camp and teach you how to play the game. It's going to be hard. It's going to suck big time. But I see potential in you. All of those kids would sign up. But if I rolled up on those same kids and said, I want to teach you how to play the game of basketball, and they saw that I can't even dribble two times in a row, none of them would go with me. 
the same is true for, for the church. Heavenly Father, we need you to do a new work within us, especially here on Pentecost Sunday, where we remember the fact that you poured out your Holy Spirit upon the church and you transform lives. Our confession to you this morning is that we need you to animate our lives with the truth of your gospel so that men and women, boys and girls, can see a transformed life and desire to be in fellowship with you. Make it so here in Friendship United Methodist Church, in our lives. Make this place a beachhead for discipleship, for the sake of our own lives, our friends and neighbors, all the children and young people in this community, but more so for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.